That's dogmatism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does she bring up uh, um, any type of quotas for women in, in, in colleges or anything like that? No, she didn't bring that up. And I'm unaware of any quota system in that regard. Um, and you could possibly continue that argument based on some other evidence, but the piece of evidence that she presented was that, and it was just as bogus as the seven dollar bill. Okay. Do you think there is any truth to it at all? No. Actually, actually, I don't. I'm not saying that college is a perfect ploy. I could spend 45 minutes telling you what I think is wrong with colleges today, but that doesn't happen to be one of them. <coughs> And I'm not saying that, that there aren't areas where men are discriminated against. There are, but that's another issue. That was, but not in terms of who gets into college. Okay. So now your, your task is to write down an example of a time you had an opinion based on personal preference rather than evidence. Maybe you've already done that while they're talking. Okay. Or at least think about it. I, I, if you don't have a piece of paper, uh, I'm not going to force you to write this down, but I want you to at least think about it. How about having an opinion not based on preference, but based on laziness? <laughs> well, that's a good point. There's a lot of that around, too, isn't there? Or they never questioned or looked into it. You just accepted the status quo. That, that is very common, and that is an excellent example. <laughs> All right, we'll move on here since we got a lot to cover here. Um, the critical thinkers practice fair-mindedness and seek a balanced view. This, I mean, again, these are all related. Um, so let me see what else I have to say about that. That's what having uh, evidence from several different perspectives can help you sort out possible weaknesses in your own thinking, or sometimes in others, uh, it can help you see where places where you just accepted what somebody else said uh, without good evidence to back it up. Fair-mindedness means reading about an issue you don't m know much about before you form an opinion. Uh, not just what other libertarians are saying, I'm sorry, that's not good enough but what thoughtful commentators from other points of view say and what research evidence suggests. I know a lot of work. I'm sorry, nobody said critical thinking was easy. <laughs> I wish it worked, then there'd be more of it, but it's not. Let me give you an example from my own personal experience. Now, as some of you may know, I'm working, uh, I'm editing a libertarian feminist anthology. And I want to be somewhat familiar with all of the issues. And when I looked into the issue of affirmative action, I found, well, actually, I already observed some things that helped here. It was clear to me that it wasn't as simple as you think. Oh, you know, the libertarian knee-jerk re reaction is to be against affirmative action. Now, what I, d I found, <coughs> Uh, both from my observations in college and also based on what I'm reading, that there were some good arguments for voluntary affirmative action. There really are subtle ways that women are discriminated against in many contexts because of the old boy network. Because Not that the guys were like outright sexist saying, we don't want women. It's not that, it's much more subtle than that. Is that you, you choose people, you hire people that you feel more comfortable with. That's what the old boy network does. And what do you know? They're going to feel more comfortable with men than women. And, I, and I've, I've seen that in, as well as reading about it. So I concluded that maybe there's a case for voluntary affirmative action if you use judiciously. Doesn't mean that I think it's okay to hire unqualified people. And I'm well aware that affirmative action has been misused. So there, we're not talking about that. 
But I, I, it seems to me that one can make a halfway reasonable case for voluntary affirmative action. That let's say you have two, two people, um, a man and a woman, or a black and an Asian, or you know, whatever combination, and they're all in the ballpark of fairly qualified. If they're not in the ball, ballpark of being fairly equal qualified, that's different. I'm not advocating hiring unequal, people who are not qualified. But then, if you, they're all sort of in the ballpark, then pick the underrepresented person, whether it's a black or a woman or whatever. Why not? They're all fairly qualified. Why not pick the ones who haven't had as good a shot at the jobs as white males? Okay, so because many of these issues are a little bit more subtle than some libertarians make them out to be. I would never ever advocate government action, that's not the point here. Sometimes there can be good arguments. Okay. I have a recent example, because you're going to be thinking about the fair-mindedness, uh, whether you've ever been uh, fair-minded or not fair-minded on some issue, and I gave several examples. Let me give you a recent example of a, what I consider to be a very one-sided argument that didn't look at the other side. A recent blog, I won't say where, you can ask me later, um, that took a very, what I consider to be a very strident position on the Occupy Wall Street position. And it was obvious to me that the person writing the blog had never really thought about, first of all, he had a very simplistic view, and he thought they were all passive robots repeating something that the socialists or Marxist gurus were saying. Well, since I actually know people involved in it, I thought, well, I think that's a little simplistic. Maybe he needed to have looked at various arguments of various people instead of saying they're all little robots. Well, then the real clincher is that it turns out that he, because when he said repeating the arguments, he meant that literally. Well, it turns out that in that demonstration, microphones are not allowed. So the reason they were repeating the argument is so that people in back could hear it. But he never looked at the evidence. He just started spouting off and attacking the Occupy Wall Street information without being fair, without seeing that there are many different kinds of people. They're not all raping socialists, they're libertarians, or anarchists, all kinds of things. He didn't see the complexity, and he didn't have all the facts. The reason they were repeating the argument is because there was no microphones. That's not being fair-minded. Okay, what's our next point here? Oh, let me give you another example. See, this is a chance when I have a chance to use all my favorite examples. I'm going to make this into an article. Here's another example, real life example. I'm not making this stuff up, of not being fair minded. Years ago, Andrea Rich asked me to do a review in, for Lace Fair Books of a book. And, and what was happening, she was, she was selling a book called The uh, sex X Y factor. It was written by a libertarian journalist. And she had a feeling that there was something wrong with this book. So she decided to ask me, she wasn't going to ask me to attack the book because she wanted to sell it regardless. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but she asked me to review another book that took a different position. Because the position of this, you know, it was a woman journalist, was that there were huge gender differences. And that's what the research showed. So she asked me to review uh, a book called Myths of Gender by Anne Fausto Sterling. And, okay, so here's what we had. We had a book about gender research written by a journalist whose only qualification for it was that she was a libertarian. 
The review for that was written by a prominent libertarian male who also knew nothing about gender research. I'm reviewing a book by one of the major players in gender research, a very well-known woman who is a professor at Brown University. I'm reviewing it. I've taught psychology of women for many, many years. I know the research. So which, I think it's really clear to the objective person who is more qualified to have an opinion on gender research. Now, can you guess which book was bought more by the laissez-faire audience? The journalists or the professors? Yeah. The journalists, because she was a libertarian. I'm sorry, that doesn't make you qualified on every issue in the world. <laughs> and in fact, the book was horrible. It was the worst, most embarrassing book on gender I've ever read. The woman didn't, she was out of her depth. She did not know what she was talking about. It was, it was, I was embarrassed for her. Because I actually met her once. She's not a nice old person. She's a good person. But she didn't know what she didn't know. One of the, by the way, let me, uh, a quick aside here. There's this wonderful principle which you need to read about in, in psychology. I call it the incompetent syndrome, but the official name is the Dunning-Kruger effect. And what it, people who don't know much about a topic don't know how much they don't know. So they think they're more competent than they're, they are. We all know the type. This research was just made such an impact on psychology. We'd all seen it. it I'm sure they got tenure just based on this research. Those who are very competent in an area know how much they don't know, and they're not as uh, impressed with their own knowledge. Okay, A lot of people suffer from the incompetence syndrome. And bless this woman's heart, nice person. She didn't know what she didn't know. And it was just a god awful book. With that, is, is that kind of the uh, meaning behind the expression that the more I know, the more I don't know? Or do you That's know right. A lot of people are unaware of that. But the point for our purposes is if you were being fair minded, you would have read both books. But that's not what happened. Yes? Um, the term sophomore. Uh, like in college, is kind of based on that idea where you know you're either a wise fool or a foolish wise person. You, you know enough that you start spouting off about things, but then by the time you graduate, maybe study some more, have a little more life experience. Yes, yes. You realize that you know you thought you know a lot more at 20 than you do at 40. Yes, and those of us who've reached that point understand that. That's a, that's a good point. Okay, so your, your task is to think of some time when you weren't fair-minded. By now you've probably done that, so I'm going to move on because we're running short on time. The next point is a, uh, a critical thinker practices restraint, controlling their feelings rather than being controlled by them and thinking before acting. If you act impulsively on your gut feelings, and we've all done it, I've certainly done it, but if you do that, it may be because you have ideas that you can't rationally defend. Not, not all the time, but occasionally. It's easier to act before you think. Uh, for example, reacting with epithets to uh, leftists or conservatives instead of saying, why do you believe that? You call them names instead of saying, why do you believe that? That would be an example. What are your reasons? Or, Here's another one that I, my opinion is that it was a gut level feeling. The people who reacted positively on a gut level to the libertarian who said, if you can't persuade your friends to become libertarians, you should drop them. When I heard this person say that, I was dumbfounded. I thought, oh my God, we've seen enough of that in the libertarian movement. The Rand Brandon split. I was around, I saw it up close and personal. We don't need that. But this sound to me, I, I, I thought, this sounds like cult talk. This is a Scientologist. Okay, so my gut level feeling was WTF. <laughs> uh, and you know, I'm not going to say anything rude, any more rude than that on videotape. But that, okay, but then what I did, okay, that was my gut level feeling. But 